I would like to begin with, uh, well, I'd like to echo the greetings to all those listening in and all of you here. And uh, we do have a, a beautiful Sabbath day in East Texas today. And I was uh, thinking of a, a memory of mine. I still have a few of them. It was, and I'm old enough to remember this day, November 22nd, 1963. And I know most, most here in the congregation can remember that. I was in the first grade at River Road Middle School, north of Amarillo, Texas. And all of a sudden, this quiet first grade class, the, the uh, speaker with the PA system erupted in static and there was a voice trying to say something but we couldn't understand it. And uh, I remember my teacher, Mrs. Kimber, took her yardstick, went over and started beating on the speaker. I guess to perhaps get the attention of who might have turned it on accidentally or something, but to no avail. Well, next we went out to recess, and uh, I was unaware until another first grader from another class told me that President John F. Kennedy had just been shot and killed in Dallas. And we think of these historical events, and I've noticed through the years, and, and I've even heard, I, I don't guess you'd call it a testimonial, but examples of, of the answer to the question, where were you? You know, where were you when that happened? Well, I. I kind of mentioned where I was, and, uh, it, and it kind of stands out because of such a historical event or a catastrophic, catastrophic event. And I know there are some listening who probably remember December 7th, 1941. And uh, more recently, that question is asked uh, uh, concerning September 11th. In fact, Alan Jackson wrote that song, you know, where were you when the world stopped turning? And his emphasis, was uh, much about uh, the subject of what I want to cover today was on hopefully we, hopefully we were loving our family. No matter what's going on, no matter what's happening, hopefully our mainstay in life is we are loving God and loving our family. So I'd like to title the sermon, Where Were You? And I don't want to ask that focus just on one day, one historic event, or a catastrophe that we can remember. But I'd like to ask, where were you from a perspective that I happen to have some experience in, and most of us talk about something we, we have experience in. And I would like to ask that question from the perspective of a father. And so I want to address the fathers who are here and those who are listening. You know, as, as we know, everyone can still listen, even though I'm focusing on the fathers, because uh, if I am able to convey a principle or a value uh, that uh, God wants us to, to learn from and to practice, then we, we know that applies to all of our lives. But I want to focus to the fathers, the young ones, the old ones, the grandfathers, and yes, the fathers to be. So where were you, not just on one day, but every day as a father? And what is the answer to where should I be as a father? And perhaps there are, there are several answers, and you could have your own, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have one that uh, is beneficial and, and thought-provoking for us. Uh, we can look at some scriptures concerning fathers, and the ones we, we tend to always turn to, and we will, are in Proverbs. Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, verse 6, uh, I have marked in my Bible since I was a very new father, and uh, parents, including mothers, we, we know this proverb. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he was old, he will not depart from it. And I have verses that I go to next because of this subject as a young father. Verse 15 of the same chapter. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So we're instructed here to, to discipline our children. And I've got several more I could read here in Proverbs, and most of them are along that line. Uh, but I uh, like to turn to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 4, and the Apostle Paul 
to me here, as we think about those instructions in the Proverbs and throughout the Bible, he puts the atmosphere that we should do this training and, and take on this responsibility as a father and as a parent. In Ephesians 6, verse 4, it says, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And so here we have the, the Apostle Paul, who, as far as I know, wasn't a father, yet he relayed God's instructions on the atmosphere we should have as we rear and train our children. Now, any research or child-rearing teaching will tell you these principles work. And yes, they do. But there's one essential ingredient that must accompany them. There's something that has to be done in order to receive the blessings and the benefits of these instructions. You must be present to win. As a father, you must be present. You know, one thing my wife and I don't do very often is go to a theater and see a movie, but uh, we, we did do that last weekend. And we went to see the Clint Eastwood movie, The Mule. I don't know if any of you have seen it, and I hope I don't spoil it for you if you want to, or when it comes out later, as we usually do. Don't, uh, but it was, uh, of course, a somewhat different Clint Eastwood movie, very different from the Hang 'em High and Good, Bad, and Ugly and the Dirty Harry series. And, uh, you know, while it had a story, my wife and I both seemed to focus more on the story within the story. And we both would comment to each other about it during and even after. But, uh, the character Clint Eastwood plays in here, he's a husband, he's a father, he's very aged as he is in, in real life. He was hardworking, always put his work before his family, evident in the movie. He always put his friends and buddies before his family. He missed almost every important event that his wife and daughter and granddaughter had in life. And he seemingly unaffected by the pressure from the family to participate in the family. Yet, I noticed everyone else he came in contact with and met just loved him. I mean, they adored him. And he would get a pass, you know, when he broke the rules or anything he did. You know, everything just, it seemed to go good for him. Happy-go-lucky, enjoying life, doing his own thing. But he was a father. He had the title of a father, but he wasn't present in their lives. And I was thinking about that, and I ran across an article online, and it's by a man named Daniel Darling. And as I read it, I happened to really relate to this man's article and the concerns he is having as a father and his responsibilities at this point in life. This was written last uh, April uh, 2018. And uh, he has four children, and I have four children. Now, but I have the luxury of looking back at what this man is experiencing and is concerned about. And the name of the article is, The Dad I Want to Be. And I'd like to read probably most of it. I'll skip over some of it, but uh, he starts out, it's 7.30 at night, and I'm staring at my iPhone for no apparent reason. There's no crisis in the world that requires me, no organizational issue that demands a response, and no critical communication I must conduct on behalf of my family or friends. I'm just scrolling through Twitter aimlessly. This is probably a justifiable use of time during leisure activity or when waiting in a doctor's office, but not at 7.30 on a weekday when the kids need my attention. And yet here I am, escaping the messy reality of being present as a parent for the cheap comfort of the passive and useless acquisition of knowledge. And breaking from the reading, we do often complain about children and the time they spend on gadgets, but it's not just the children, is it? We find ourselves 
doing much of the same thing. Okay, don't do that again. <laughs> and then he goes on, back to the reading. The shame hits me, not, not in the moment when I'm checking over a funny tweet, but later when I kiss my youngest daughter on the forehead before putting her to bed. Will she know me as a good and godly dad who pointed her to the Heavenly Father? Or will she know me as that adult male in her home who gave only small bursts of attention while his phone was charging? I'd like to think I'm the former, but there are too many nights when I'm the latter. There is the father I should be, and there is the father I really am. The gap between those two is wide, and I live in that chasm every day. The article changes here with a heading called The Good Dads of the Bible. I once thought about, as he continues, doing a project on the fathers of the Bible, a sort of devotional book for men that featured heroic examples of fatherhood. The problem with this project, however, is I had few two subjects. There just aren't that many really good dads in scripture. I mean, we have the Old Testament Joseph who overcame family dysfunction to become what appears to be a good father to his own sons. We have Noah who, though far from perfect, obeyed God and shepherded his family to safety. We have the New Testament Joseph, who listened to the Lord's angels, married his unwed, pregnant fiance, and cared for her despite the social pressure to put her away. Other than that, not much. And he mentions, I'll skip over the negative examples of those, we, you know, at least the details of David and even Noah and others. And he does mention there are some Probably more examples of mothers and grandmothers, uh, especially in the New Testament. Then uh, he continues, I believe the Bible shows few examples of a good fathering and many examples of bad fathering for a purpose as a part of an overall theme that highlights the way sin has so corrupted the human condition. Scripture both cultivates the longing in every human heart for a good dad and points to God as a heavenly father who fills in where earthly dads disappoint. Even the best men are Adam's heirs, who can either use power to exploit or retreat from responsibility and with passivity. Only one man, the second Adam, fulfills God's vision for masculinity. The story of the Bible is not about its heroes, but about one hero. It's not about the brave exploits of David, Abraham, and Noah, but about the brave exploit of Christ in renewing and restoring his creation. This matters for everyone, not for just those who have bad memories of their own father. It keeps us fathers from being overwhelmed when we recognize, recognize how often we fall short. Nothing puts a man in touch with his frailties quite like being a dad. Parenting, so easy in theory, is hard in reality where the action is live and we're faced with on-the-spot de decisions between selfishness and sacrifice. Even the best dads need supernatural power, the power of God's Spirit, and the understanding that as we are trying and failing to parent, God is parenting our children and filling the gaps. Sometimes on some days, those gaps are vast. He continues on under the heading, redemption instead of regret. And I think this next paragraph, I could ask the question, how will we be defined? And uh, I think he gives a pretty good answer. Through my failures, like Jacob's limp, will always be present as a reminder of my dependence on God. I don't have to be identified with those missteps. So we, with all of our weaknesses, can be defined as dependent on God. What's more, God is not wringing his hands. Yes, I will be accountable for my fathering, but my own kids will have to see in their experiences the hands of the Heavenly Father, tracing their steps toward his sovereign will. To trust that God knows best for my own kids is perhaps the deepest level of faith a human can summon. The reality that I am the only, ver only a version of an earthly, the only version of an earthly father they will ever have is sobering. This requires a faith that only the spirit can provide, a plan only God could conceive. Father knows best, yes, 
but only if we're talking about the Heavenly Father. As he continues, some might say this theology dampens our motivation to father intentionally. In other words, we, we kind of have an out, is what he's trying to say. But as he continues, it's better perhaps to live with a kind of a consuming fear. But I see that grace works a different way. Redemption, confession, and trust are catalysts like fuel to parenting well and to parenting good. And I think in the side over here I wrote, this is the Christian father's condition, or we could say the Christian condition. And when we think about grace, oftentimes, you know, some define it as the license to sin. But that understanding of grace, and this is me speaking, not him, is, is a catalyst and a fuel for us to obey God and to seek to be more like Jesus Christ and the Father. Then back to the reading Knowing I don't have to perform to earn God's favor, I am free to live out my calling as a parent, to be filled with the Spirit and to love my children the way I am called to love them. I am free to depend on Jesus, to pray deeply and to love well. I'm liberated to apologize to my kids when I get it wrong and point them to that same well of grace for their own failures. Even in the best families, there are deep pockets of dysfunction, but God is in the business of restoring what is broken of healing what the enemy has made sick. God is a recreating God in my own life and in the lives of others. And the next section is called Fight Over Flight. And I also say this is a little further explanation of the Christian condition as he continues. So we fight on as fathers. Rather, rather than languish in the daily stew of our own inadequacy, we press forward with faithfulness, learning, listening, loving, Knowing our weaknesses, we lean into the Spirit of God and lead our families. My four kids, they need me. They need me working for sanctification and repenting of my sins. They need me pressing through the inadequacies and modeling the life of Christ among them. They need me both strong and weak. Too many of us yield the fight and walk away. Some dads physically exit the home. Their taillights, the only lasting legacy. Others leave emotionally or spiritually, outsourcing the trench warfare to the church or leaving their wives to fight alone for the children. As he continues, God calls us to something better and empowers us. We can't change what we've already failed, but we shouldn't let past failures paralyze us. Right now in this exact moment, I can be faithful. And I just add, so can we. No matter what has happened up to this point in your experience with your father or as a father, we can be faithful. He continues, I can put down my phone. I can seek peace in this conversation. I can turn away from selfishness and toward service. He continues, Satan's first lie is always that sin will make us more human. His second lie is always that sin is who we are. Yet we know that in Christ, we are not our struggles, our inadequacies, and our, regret, our regrets. We are being made whole. We are being made new into the Father's God planned from the beginning for us to be. And that concludes the article. And uh, I realized, well, yes, I'm older now. And as I look back, I can remember when my children were about the age of, of this man's children. And I remember, I think my wife probably remembers me coming home and, and sharing this with her. A very dear friend of mine, Mr. Harold Rowe, told me one day at work, he said, Stan, no matter how old you get and how old your children are, you're their father for life. You never stop nurturing. You never stop worrying about them. You never stop praying for them. You never stop encouraging them. And you never stop wanting the very best for them. And that is so true. You know, another truth I've observed as time goes on is we never stop learning how great and how merciful our Heavenly Father is. 
you know, I had a younger brother, and I have an older brother, and I had a younger brother, and from about the age of six months old, he was bigger than me from then on. So I know, especially those on looking at the webcam and all of you look up here at me and say, no way, there's no way you could have been the runt of the family. But at one time, I was, and Grandma's not here to vouch for me, but anyway. But my younger brother was a, was a good athlete, especially in basketball, but I'm still convinced his best and strongest talent was the ability to pester someone to the point of extreme anger and even rage. And he enjoyed it so that he could just relish that accomplishment, making someone so angry. And I mentioned that we never stopped learning, and I look back now at a summer we were spending with my grandparents and my little bigger brother was doing the very thing. I mean, he got me so angry. I mean, there was no stopping me. I was going to physically handle it. And my granddad intervened, had his belt off, and eventually I settled down and he didn't use the belt. And I got to think, I look back on that now, and, as, and that, now that I'm a grandfather especially, when, the, when you spend a lot of time with your grandkids, there's gonna be squabbles, there's gonna be incidents and issues. And I'm thinking, you know, my granddad, the first thing he wanted was for us to behave for our own good. And then the last thing he wanted was to have to punish us in order for that to happen. I think God's a lot like that. He wants us to behave for our own good and for those blessings he gives us. And the last thing he wants to do is punish us. And we can look at that personally we can especially look at it nationally, I would say. I'll be concluding over in Matthew, the 25th chapter, be verse 31 through 40. And we're familiar with this. We read it at the end of the feast. And... Uh, Before I start reading, though, I'd like to mention the conclusion of that movie my wife and I saw, or near the conclusion. Here was the character. He was finally caught for his illegal activities and was before the judge in court. And his defense lawyer was making this stand for him because he had never had a charge against him in, a life, in his life, not even a traffic ticket. And before she could continue defending him, he said, guilty. I'm guilty. And the judge tried to stop him and say, now you know what you're doing. You'll be going to prison for the rest of your life. He said, I'm guilty. Guilty. And my wife and I both, when we talked about that, said, you know, more than he's confessing to the guilt of those illegal crimes, he was confessing to the guilt of not being there as a father. This parable of the sheep and the goats, I would like to, if I can, take the liberty to paraphrase it a little bit for this sermon. And I'd like to call it the where were you parable. And I'll start in verse 31 where it says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from the other. The shepherd divides his sheep from his goats, as he does. Verse 33, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king shall say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then the next two verses, he lists six conditions. And these are six conditions that we see in the world. And yes, they are physical conditions. They are also spiritual conditions. And if these conditions are in the world, they at one time began in a family. 
they have just gotten exponentially larger. Verse 35, he says, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. Well, I don't think we have to say, well, of course we're going to feed that newborn baby. We're going to feed our children and provide for them. But what about the other things they hunger for? The attention of a father, the, the love. We have a very loving family. We, we've always hugged and uh, I'd say we have a lot of love in the family, but I have one particular daughter when I would come home from work. I would every day see this when she was able, able to walk and on up till she was fairly big, this one gesture. Without words, that was saying, Daddy, pick me up. And she would not give in. And I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, I never neglected the chance to pick her up. Even if I had a handful of plans and things, I would get rid of those and pick her up. And I would encourage all the fathers, never miss an opportunity to pick one of your children up. Just as Christ said, suffer not the little children, bring them to me. That's a good example to follow. The passage continues, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Well, children, and I, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to re refer to the physical so much. We take, we take that for granted that we are, I mean, everyone in this room wouldn't think of not feeding and, and giving our children their needs. But what else are they thirsty for? They're, they're thirsty for relationships. They're thirsty for, to at a certain age, sports. They're thirsty for what that has to offer, an education. They get to a certain point, they want to start a business. As a father, let's encourage them to quench that thirst. Let's don't uh, talk down or dismiss any goal that are gleam in the eye of children. Let's support them. The passage continues. I was a stranger and you took me in. I refer to movies and songs a lot and I think I do that because they're a reflection of the human condition. Reba McIntyre had a song called The Greatest Man I Never Knew. He lived just down the hall. He was in his paper, she was in her room. A relationship where this father and daughter lived in the same house a few feet from each other, but didn't know each other. Uh, song can shed some light on that. And Christ says, you know, if you are a stranger, if they're a stranger, we don't want our children to be a stranger in our own house. Take, take them in, take them in. Verse 36, naked and you clothed me. And perhaps, you know, once again, of course we're going to provide clothing and shelter for our children. But what about if, especially they're, when they're really trying to do good, adhere to what the church is saying? Are they a target? And, and perhaps naked is not the, the best analogy, but perhaps they're outcast socially because maybe they're not there on certain days or times when everybody else is. So I would say clothe them with social skills. Help, help, pick, help them with their friends. You know, of course we want to keep them away from the bad influences, but let's clothe them with opportunities for social skills. And it continues, and I was sick and you visited me. Once again, we one of the biggest trials of a parent is a sick child. And sometimes, though, we're slow to recognize, perhaps emotionally, that they can be sick, too. You know, we live in a world with a lot of anxiety, depression, uh, some, you know, just uh, emotional needs. Fathers, we have to learn how to address those with daughters. We have to learn how to address them with sons. But... Let's don't squeeze that meaning of sick down just to the physical. 
And I know we're not looking at the world as we read this as we usually do. We're looking inward. We're looking to the family. As we continue, I was in prison and you came into me. Are children ever in a home who feel like they are in prison? They will reach an age where they'll say, I can't wait to leave home. Or I can't wait to leave Big Sandy. I mean, they feel imprisoned. And they hear something or see something about somewhere else. And they want it. Well, we can, we can come unto them, as Christ says. Let's go, let's go show them that big city. Show them the good parts of it. Also show them the bad. If you can safely show them the inner city, if you can, you'll probably experience this anyway, the two-hour parking lot on the six-lane freeway in the morning and in the afternoon. And I would say take them out west to the mountains, to God's creation, and let them, let them see the world. Let's don't, and I know economics come into play, let's don't make their life within the boundaries of Upshur County like a flat world, and if they step over it, they'll fall off. No, they need to see the world. So, fathers, we, yes, as church, as Christians, we need to practice this in helping the world, but we need to look inward at our family with the same principles. So, fathers, I hope we can look back and have an answer to that question. Where were you? And... I think the answer is going to be more of a state of being than a particular location. I think as the gentleman in the article mentioned, where was I? I was dependent on God and present to let my children see it. And that may not be the only answer, but hopefully we have a similar one, especially when this parable takes place and we're asked, where were you?